Good morning and welcome to worship for May 24th, 2020, in case you're still trying to remember what year it is in the midst of this lockdown. Here I'm in Christchurch, Barnton. We're able to come into it and do a little bit more ministry privately. And so I'm hoping that each Sunday when I do these recordings, I'm able to go into one of our two churches and let us be in familiar surroundings uh, while we worship. Our worship this morning is taken from the Book of Common Prayer. It's a chance to try something different and to hear the basic traditional liturgy of the church speak to us and to lead us into hearing God's voice. I hope you'll find it fruitful this morning as we spend time pondering that space after the ascension, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. So let's begin our worship. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. The Lord is king, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he is girded with strength. He has established the world, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old, you are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters, more majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Whoosh! Just like that. Like a rocket. Zoom, that's how he went. 
Better than any fireworks I've ever seen. And we were watching to see where he was going when a cloud came across. And, well, that was it. Gone. Ascended. I didn't want him to go. He'd already left us once, and that was awful. We just didn't know what to do with ourselves. We moped around, fearful for our lives, fearful for our sanity. I mean, he was our hope. We'd left everything for him. And he had promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. So when he died, what did that mean? Wasn't he who we thought he was? Was he a fake or a fool or even a fiend? So many questions and doubts. We needed him. He was showing us the way. The way to be human, to live without the rules of Pharisees or the rule of the Romans. But it was just those things, the rules and the rule, which caused his death. I didn't understand. But then, he came back. He came back. Who's ever come back from the dead? Well, except Lazarus and that little girl and... Um, well, perhaps I should have trusted him a bit more. Anyway, he rose again just like he said he would. And he gave us convincing proofs he was alive, showing us his wounds and eating fish and everything. I mean, ghosts don't eat fish, do they? And he spoke to us about the kingdom of God. And it all started to make sense, all that stuff we'd heard before but hadn't really grasped until, well, until he died, I guess. One time when we were eating, he said, Don't leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days, you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. I got all excited and I said, Lord, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He looked at me in a way which means, you haven't quite got it yet, have you? I'm getting used to that look. He said, it's not for you to know the times and dates the Father has set for his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Whoosh! Zoom! Gone! Ascended. Before I'd even had a chance to ask him what he was going on about. And we're all standing there, looking up into the sky like a load of ninnies when we hear a voice and it says, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Fair question, I guess. They mustn't have seen the whoosh. But now I think about it. They did look pretty amazing themselves, all white and shiny, like people from heaven. They said, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. I looked at my watch, and I was about to ask if they could give an estimated time of return, but they had already gone. So here we are, back in Jerusalem. We're praying and waiting, waiting and praying, and I can't say I'm not excited about the coming of the Holy Spirit, whatever that might be. But to be honest, I'd rather Jesus came back himself, I need him. No one knows me like he does. No one shows me God like he does. But I guess even more than that, the world needs him. Israel needs to be restored. God's kingdom needs to come to this world. And Jesus is the only one to do it. I really believe that. And I want to help. But how can I do it on my own? We need hundreds, thousands, millions to follow him and take his message to the world. Share his love for us and build his kingdom. Come on, God. We need your help. I don't know about you, but these days I don't receive very many handwritten letters when I do, I'm slightly worried because in my experience as a vicar, particularly in the early days, the people who wrote to you 
it, with handwriting. It tended to be in green ink, and it tended to be telling you how terrible you were doing at your job, how unhappy they might be. In the New Testament, Paul wrote lots of letters to the churches he founded around the Roman Empire in the Near East. And sometimes those letters were not great reading for the people receiving them. It was telling them to get their act together and to change what they were doing so they could be a stronger body of Christ together. But with some of his churches who were struggling against persecution and struggling against disinterest by their neighbors and struggling against active interference with them trying to practice this new faith and follow this person called Jesus, he was very encouraging. He writes very tenderly, almost like a father who's away but wants to be there with his children. The, letter, the reading we have from Ephesians this morning would be a great letter to receive at any time. We have heard of your faith. You love each other, and we've heard about that. We know that the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in heaven is in you, the church, the people of God. You will be able to do what he's called you to do. What he sends you to do, he gives you the power to accomplish. Discover what that vocation is. Discover how you might do it, and then go and do it. There is no other power in the universe, that he, he tells them, that is higher than Christ. They are, everything that is powerful in the universe that we see is under Christ's feet. Therefore, they're under our feet, too. And he wants to encourage this little church to know that they're not just good people doing good things. They have real power over spiritual things and physical things. The ascension is when we stop being students and apprentices of Christ, and we set out to set up our own businesses, if you will, our own enterprises. You may be familiar with Timpsons. They might have cut keys for you. Uh, resold your shoes, maybe did some dry cleaning for you. And each one of those is a franchise. They're owned by somebody who buys materials off Timpsons, gets trained by Timpsons, but they then open up in that little box and they're the one who has to make it work and for it to make money. The person who runs the local Timpsons wants to treat you well because if you're not treated well, you're not going to come back again and he's not going to make a living. I found with Timson, sometimes you've come and you said, oh gosh, I've left it really late for my dry cleaning. I've got a wedding on a Saturday and you know, he'll put my suit ahead of some other ones because he knows I need that. That's why I go back again and get my dry cleaning done by him or a key cut by that person because he seems to care about me and to care that I'm coming here to, take, um, to, to give him some of my business. He wants me to come back because I value what he does and how I'm treated by him. One thing I've noticed about churches going out and doing their vocation and running their business after being apprentices and students to Christ is that there's no guarantee to anything going right for us or us being successful, whatever that really means. A church might have the best music group, the best preachers, the best pastoral care, but if they lack the vital ingredient of being church, then it doesn't matter. And that vital ingredient is love. The vital ingredient for a church are people filled with the fullness of Christ. And that's always expressed first and foremost by how those people love. We have heard of your faith. We have heard how you, as the body of Christ, know how to love the world and to love each other. When we're being that body of Christ, we need confidence. We need to know that we follow what he's called us to do. Do we seem overcome by the powers and principalities who have actually already been defeated? Do we seem filled with the fullness of Christ, filled with love that overflows so that there's plenty for everyone else around? Do we love deeply and when people meet us, do we give them life or do we seem to take life away from them? My experience in church life and those of others who I spend time with is that those who draw near to us and draw near to church as a way of drawing near to Christ only stick around if they find the answers to these questions. Did these people seem to be alive? Is this worth my while? Will they let me belong as well 
in the same way they do? Am I going to be judged about who I am and have to change in order to be accepted? Will people be patient with me with what I don't know, with those things in my life that I still haven't quite redeemed or got worked out? Will they make room for me here? When I come in, will there be a smile for me? Will I seem to be someone who belongs here and that others are accustomed to having me here? Will I know love here? Will I be allowed to make mistakes? They don't sometimes sound like huge questions, but at the heart of everything we are. Do I belong here? Will I be loved? Will I want to be here? And will it be worth my time and giving my life to? Love is at the heart of the gospel. It's at the heart of all of our evangelism. It's at the heart of, that makes us more than just a club that meets together and does some uplifting, inspiring thing with each other. There's a Christian songwriter in the 1970s who wrote this lyric, which has never left me. Without love, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing without love. And that's so much of the gospel summed up in such a short and easy way. Jesus got a response from people. Sometimes it was a negative response. Sometimes it was a wary response. Sometimes it was really positive. But no one in the gospel stories responds to Jesus with indifference. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Yeah, whatever. And he walks on. When people encounter a church that's full of Christ, they want to know what it has to say. They're intrigued by how it stands out from everybody else in the world who don't really have time for them, don't have any love for them, don't have a place for them. They want to know why you're doing this. They're going to want to know what the catch is. But if we're doing it right, there is no catch. It's just we have experienced the love that God has given us, and it is so good that we want to share that love with other people. And that's what's special about what Paul writes to the Ephesian church when he says, way to go, guys. You understand what this church thing is about. People know about you because you are getting the main ingredients, the essentials, absolutely right. You're starting with love for each other and love for your neighbors and then working out how to be church from there. That's the work that Jesus leaves behind when he ascends. It's not about doing good stuff so we can get the brownie points that get us into heaven. It's not to make people feel loved so they'll join us and give us their money and perhaps become PCC members and church, you already get falling asleep at that. It's not to get them to come and be something and make us survive. We love the world because we, love, we feel loved by God. And that love is so good that we want others to be as happy and loved in that way as we are. One of my favorite books is Pride and Prejudice. And at the end of the book, as we get towards everything turning out all right, 200 years spoiler alert, Jane Bennett finally gets her proposal from Mr. Bingley, which she thought was never going to happen. Her whole life has changed from possible spinsterhood to becoming one of the wealthiest women in the country. But her deepest happiness is that she has someone she can love and who loves her deeply as well. She exclaims to her sister Lizzie, it is too much, by far too much. I do not deserve it. Why is not everybody as happy as I? And we might paraphrase her and ask, why is not everybody as loved as we are? God pours his love into our hearts and he pours so much of it that it overflows. We can't bear all of it and we have to give it away. I tend to find the people I meet and I look at the world around me and one of the main missing ingredients in the world today is love. When you're a community of people built on love and practicing love and exercising love and doing it in the way that Jesus does, people respond to you in the same way that they respond to Jesus. People were attracted to Jesus because he said stuff they didn't expect him to say about how God is near and how God felt about them and what God was doing to make life right for them. So the question for every church is how well known are you for your love? 
and our job following Jesus' command to go and do the work that he sent us to do is answering that question through our life together and in the community. How well are you known for your love? And we should just through the everyday rough and tumble of our church, to, church life together, see how people are loved around us, see how we love each other, because God's loved us and he's filled our hearts with love to give away. And we know that that's what our work is now and forever. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee and do thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O God, the King of glory, who hast exalted thine only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph unto thy kingdom in heaven, we beseech thee, leave us not comfortless, but send to us thine Holy Ghost to comfort us and exalt us unto the same place whither our Saviour Christ has gone before, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who hast safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by thy governance to do always what is righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who hast given us grace at this time, with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>